So hello everyone, my name is Geraldine O'Reilly and I work at Clio as our UK Regional Marketing Manager. I'm delighted to be bringing you today's session, which is the second instalment in our How to Grow a Law Firm series. Now this series will run for the remainder of 2022 and in it we feature firms that are growing and scaling their legal businesses in unique ways. And for each session, we're not only featuring a unique firm, but we'll also hone in on a specific team so that others can learn from these firms and think about their approach to growth as well. So in today's session, Building Foundations That Scale, we'll discuss how a process-driven foundation can help you build a thriving firm. To discuss this, we have asked a firm that is doing just that, the team at Farha Legal. So Farah Legal provides specialist advice to the technology and finance sectors. Farah is focused on serving key stakeholders through the corporate life cycle, starting from the first equity fundraise to a billion dollar leveraged buyout. They're building a team to really service their clients' needs from corporation right through to exit. And Farah are an example of how investing in the right processes and systems can help you grow your law firm. From an initial team of just one in 2015, they've increased their staff size to almost 20 in 2022. And joining us today are three members of that team. So we've got James Farah, founder and managing partner. James is a senior corporate lawyer who specializes in corporate transactions and all aspects of corporate governance. James trained at a leading magic circle firm uh, a leading magic service city law firm that is, and later practiced at a top US law firm in the city. He left, he then left city practice with a vision of working to build companies from the ground up, as well as a vision for how he wanted to look after his clients. Since leaving the city, James has been involved in the creation, startup and growth of dozens of companies, and not just as a legal advisor. He has also contributed to businesses as Wait For It, Founder, co-founder, investor, trusted advisor, outsourced general counsel, corporate counsel, and general friend to dozens of companies, which between them represent hundreds of millions of enterprise value. We've also got Joe Chowdhury, commercial lawyer. So Joe commenced her legal career at Triers and Hamlin's LLP, where she worked in both London and Dubai on commercial and corporate law. She then moved to SAS, a leading, a leading data analytics company working in-house in their commercial contracts team. And then Joe then joined Farah, specializing in preparing and negotiating commercial contracts for clients, as well as carrying out professional support lawyer activities for the firm. And finally, last but last not least, by no means, we have Shirley Gardner, who is the administration and procurement manager at Farah. So Shirley is, no, um, is not new to Clio webinars. She joined us last year for, for a session all about office management. Um, and Shirley is a highly capable and experienced legal secretary. In addition to her wealth of knowledge of US corporate law firms, she is adept at managing complex diary, travel and document management for firms. And so Shirley has been with FAR for over four years, exclusively working from home before other firms were doing similar. She has a keen eye for identifying and initiating efficiency-driven solutions that ensure she and Farah can provide exceptional support to highly demanding international commercial legal services. So James, Joe and Shirley, thank you so much for joining us today. I really, really appreciate the three of you taking time out of your very busy schedules to join us. So before we get into it today, I want to mention a couple of things. So today's session will be 45 minutes in length. Uh, we'll get you out before 12 noon, I promise. Uh, so you can start your lunch early, catch up on emails before you go on lunch. Um, and then we will also be recording today's session. So it is being recorded right now. Um, and we'll be sending the recording out tomorrow. We want lots of Q&A. So I see the chat is already on fire right now with people letting us know where they're joining from. Um, so keep that going. Uh, the more Q&As and, and, and commentary in the chat, the better. Um, and if you could select everyone in the drop down, it means that everyone will see your commentary and suggestions and feedback. And um, you can also use the Q&A function as well, uh, should you want to ask a question specifically of any of the panelists today, 
it's always good to include who the question is for as well. Um, so then it makes it a little bit easier for, for moderating. So as mentioned, I work at Clio and Clio is on a mission to transform the legal experience for all. And that mission is, and this session is really part of that mission. Being the market leader for legal technology means that we have an added responsibility to set the tone for the next generation of lawyer and law firm and to help ensure that technology shaping legal experiences is also serving the greater good. So by providing a platform for our community to tell their stories of growth and innovation, we are hopeful others will be inspired and together we'll make that mission a reality. Back to our main discussion uh, for today. To build on a great structure, you need to start with a rock solid foundation. And when it comes to growing a law firm, that means building the processes that grow with your team. But that's not as easy as it, that statement might make it sound. There are many challenges to getting the right processes in place and to help set the scene for today's discussion with the FARA team. I'd like to launch another poll, so bear with me, uh, and to get people's insight on what it is that they find most difficult when setting up new processes at their firm. So if you could please um, let us know, select one option. If there is an option that's not on there that you would say is probably your most challenging uh, part of setting up new, pro new processes, pop it into the chat, it would be good to know. So we'll leave that running um, and we're getting people voting on it right now. So that's really the, the four options there. So setting new expectations with clients, is that the most difficult part? Is it managing the change with existing staff? Is it actually identifying if technology is needed and when it's needed? Or is it understanding if the process or the new process is actually working? And if there is an option there or a challenge that's not listed, please let us know in the chat um, and we can discuss that later on. So this really helps to set the scene for our conversation. Perfect, so it's looking like people find the most challenging, and it seems to be a bit of a tie right now, is managing the change with staff and also understanding if the new systems and processes are actually working. There's pretty much a tie there. So I'm going to end our poll. And yeah, I'm going to end it now and I'll just share the results very quickly. So you should now see our results there. Um, so it's almost a tie. Managing change with staff seems to be the biggest challenge. Um, and then quickly followed by understanding if the new process and systems are actually working. Um, I mean, some commentary in there is as well. So yeah, comment there on actually getting clients to use new processes as well. So fantastic. Thank you for, for engaging on that, everybody. Um, now, if we could welcome Shirley, Joe and James to our session. Uh, we will start our conversation now, um, and if you have any questions, please do pop them into the chat, let us know who they're for. Um, I'm going to come to you, James, first, if that's okay. would love to know a little bit more about why you set up Fire Legal back in 2015, and, and to kind of set the scene for our attendees as to, I, I know I gave a little bit of an overview for Fire, but I know you'll have much more insight into why it is you set up and what it is that your firm does. So uh, firstly, thank you very much for having us all um, on the session, Geraldine. We're really delighted to have been, to have been asked. Um, I set the firm up in, well, you, I sort of set the firm up in 2015. So we've been a law firm since 2019. Um, before that, I set out on my own in 2015 as a sole practitioner. Uh, using uh, someone else's uh, sort of umbrella structure, essentially. So um, bringing all of my own work and doing, bring everything except, except for the regulatory and insurance sort of infrastructure. Um, and there was an email address that they provided, but they didn't provide a, a great deal more than that. So um, I set up under that structure, but, uh, you know, as we were, as I was sort of doing more work, finding new clients and wanting to do my own advertising, marketing um, and business development, it, I sort of reached a point where there was a choice between doing that for someone else who wasn't providing a great deal of return, although they were providing the, the regulatory coverage, or trying to do that 
you know, for my own my own um, thing. So we took some advice and set up as a firm of consultants initially. Um, a lot of the work that we do is corporate work, um, investment rounds for venture capital and um, equity fundraising. And then also we do some sort of outsourced general counsel work. So that worked quite well on a purely kind of contractual sort of freelance basis. Um, but over time, we kept coming up against more and more law firms, particularly on the fundraising side. And um, there was a sort of lack of substance to being a, a consultant, I think, that we needed to, to address. And we also started doing some regulated activities um, <clears throat> or wanting to. So in 2019, we got a bit of the bullet and, um, and, and became an SRA regulated, uh, regulated firm. Um, and our business is focused almost 100% on um, fundraising for early stage um, venture capital backed companies. So getting we, we try to support them from as early as possible um, and all the way through, ideally to exit, but um, so far we've sort of taken a few to series ABC um, and we're kind of heading towards the exit with, a, with one or two. Um, but the, 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 the firm really exists to, to sort of assist companies in, in who are starting out um, with, with the fundraising process and with growing their businesses. Um, and as we go, we, we sort of focus at the moment on seed and series A rounds, which is kind of anything from about a million pounds worth of equity capital being raised upwards. And that's really just a, um, a pricing issue. Uh, we just in order to be able to, to service them well, charge the right amount, that's the level that you know fits our business at the moment. And the further down the chain we, we try to go down all the way to kind of incorporation level, um, the more process you need, the more kind of structure you need in order to sort of productize the service to be able to deliver it efficiently, profitably for us and, and effectively for them. So that's sort of, the, we're actually going down the, the chain as well as up the chain from, from where we are. But we found a kind of sweet spot where there's there are clients for us to pick up um, work for us to do at, at the right price for us. Um, and while we refine our, our processes and our business to, to be able to sort of help the larger companies and the, and the smaller ones as well. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, James. And um, where did you, or like, where did you actually start off? What was the, the first kind of product or if you were to term it that way, service um, you looked at providing? Yeah, we, I, I think when you start and people probably have a similar experience, but we did a bit of everything really that we know to break the inertia at the very beginning i started with no clients i had one client i think um and in order to kind of get moving you have to just do lots of things uh and then slowly over time focus in on on the things that you do best and that you can charge the most for you know and have the right combination of value and profitability value for the client profitability for us so um at the beginning, I think the first thing I did was a was a convertible loan note and a partnership agreement, um, and it really, you know, I really started with nothing, with, with sort of at zero, with no infrastructure whatsoever. My copy of Microsoft Word and a laptop. Um, I think I bought the, a template for for one of those documents off, off a website for fifty pounds and used it just to have something to to start. So I didn't start at absolute zero, um, and and sort of worked up from there. So. Um, yeah, that, that was, that was how, how we, we, we got started. Yeah. Um, and there was a question that just came in there asking, are you a consultant? So did you start out as a consultant or how did that look? So we, we started, I started out as a solicitor, um, under someone else's umbrella, um, and then got a bit fed up with the lack of infrastructure and wasn't that keen on sort of doing all the marketing activities I was thinking of doing. Um, and so uh, became a consultant. It was, I would say at that point, it was, it was a much grayer thing to have done than um, it is now. It's much clearer under the, the updated um, SRA um, rules than it was then, although we, we took quite a bit of time to think about it and advice on, on whether or not what we were doing was, was fine to deliver that way. Um, but yeah, we were a consultant and now we're a law firm again. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and there's always the temptation to have a bit of the business that's separate and not regulated because of the, the cost base of being regulated. 
um, doesn't necessarily make sense. So for those early stage uh, clients, for example, some of that work around shareholders agreements and articles um, that we want to deliver in a much more focused productized way, we would probably deliver more cost effectively as well if we um, if we weren't regulated. But I think that advantage is just sort of disappears with time because the, the cost base of the regulatory cost base reduces proportionate to the size of the, the company growing. So um, that w- would probably won't go down that route, but it was tempting for a little bit. Okay, interesting. Um, and would you say in those, so you mentioned that part of the reason for the for the move away from the umbrella org was the infrastructure uh, part of things. Would you say that was regulatory led or more so it was internal thing that, that you, that irked um, you? When I when I left the city, I I kind of had this idea that you know I'd, I'd worked on a um, in a firm where we had four floors of a building, and I never met the people on floor on the three floors of, above. Uh, and in fact, we worked with they had offices around the world, and we worked with those offices, and everything was done on email and phone. So it was quite clear to me back then that being in the same place had limited value for the certain types of work for certain types of work it's very important but the way that that firm was structured um we had very limited interaction amongst ourselves outside of phone and email um and so uh when when i was setting up the firm it was clear that um we didn't need that level we didn't need an office uh, to, to start with especially if it was on my own but then later as we added more people um i focused more on the practicing environment in a digital sense so we've got um good it support we've got a full suite of um email and uh and the sort of doc um software packages that you'd expect to have and it's it, the intention was that when you sit down at a laptop in our firm you could walk out of a kind of a, a city practice and sit down at our a laptop in our firm and feel more or less at home and understand you know how to get things done in a way that was familiar. So we, we've used, so he's clear, obviously, it was one of the first things we started using um, as a practice management software. And then um, we use NetDocuments, which is a very popular document management um, system. And then uh, we've got a, quite a few other smaller pieces of software that we we add into the mix, like DocuSign and, and other things that, um, uh, and but our, we've got a properly managed um, IT setup so that people can, phone someone or send an email and get a, get a response pretty quickly um, so that they're not stuck. And we've got yeah. um, document management specialists, a small amount of document management support, those kinds of things. Brilliant. And we're going to come back to that later on. So I'm going to try and bring the conversation through a couple of stages of early stage growth, current stage and what's next. So I would love to know a little bit more about, like you set up the firm, what did that look like in terms of, who, who came next and um, what, how did you identify you know, those recruitment growth stages, I guess? Yeah, um, there's, there's sort of an element of serendipity to um, how th- that process works. Shirley um, was the first person who came next, uh, thankfully, and has been, <laughs> has been absolutely instrumental to um, the, the growth of the firm and the, and the development of any process that there is is really thanks to Shelley and Joe. Um, so, and Shelley was introduced to me by a former um, partner at the firm that I, I had left in 2013. Um, who, they, they'd worked together uh, for a long time and then um, we met and he and I had been um, they stayed in touch for uh, since I left and he said, you should meet, you should meet Shirley. So, um, Shirley joined, and it was probably a bit before we needed Shirley full time. I would say, um, and I think that's the sort of Sarah. You know, it, it, when when we've been growing, what I found is that the you, you you kind of have to take the opportunity when you when you see it. Um, and so hiring Shirley was absolutely the right thing to do. But it was we were, you know for for us as a business, we we're probably a bit too small to justify having Shirley full time. Now Shirley probably would like me to copy her three times and. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe had a fourth, but um, a fifth. But uh, yeah, so I think um, that was Shirley came first, and then um, and she just started to sort of build some of that structure around um, file opening and closing, and just helping me manage. Um, you know, there were just so there were just so many things uh, at any given time to manage, and as we had any kind of level of growth, um, the, the the volume of of um, process and documentation just expanded very, very rapidly. 
Um, and especially because we were quite focused on quite small businesses at the beginning and quite small matters. And so, um, you know, we were doing a lot, we were sort of doing a lot very quickly. Um, and so having Shirley there was, was really important to kind of build some of that, uh, that structure. And then um, we had a, a kind of paralegal at the same time when we've used a few paralegal resources in the past. Um, and Joe joined in 2019, I think, um, as a commercial solicitor. So we had quite a lot of commercial needs uh, for our existing clients where we're trying to service them between investment rounds. Joe joined part-time. Um, so she was one of a, a kind of key hire back then as well and um, has been has been instrumental and now does splits her time between commercial work and um, sort of practice management. So she does a lot of compliance work um, and uh, it's also just sort of knowledge management to the extent that we do much of that in the firm. Great, thank you, Tim. Actually, just curious now you've mentioned both, I think Shirley and Joe joined kind of part time at first. Is that something that you would say is an approach that you take to, to recruitment? Is, you know, dab, see if there's a need there and um, bring them in part time and then grow, or is it just coincidental? Well, Shirley, I think, was full time. Okay. Um, or at least sort of two thirds time and then became full time. Um, and I, yeah, I think wherever we can, we try and do things incrementally just because we're, you know, we're growing organically for want of a better expression. And so um, doing things incrementally is just, just fits with us. It also means that you're know, taking people part-time, we use a mixture of full-time employees, part-time employees, and then consultants. And that allows us to have a much broader range um, with a sort of cost base that fits our our size and profile than it would than we would otherwise. So um, that was the reason for bringing Joe yeah. um, part time. And the other thing was that we didn't have a full time role for a commercial sister. And one of the one of the things that you know I, I was keen on uh, when setting up the firm was to to make the firm a flexible working environment so that um, people could work as much or as little as as they wanted in a sense. Uh, Obviously, we need to service the client's demand, but um, but the idea was to sort of create something, a structure that was flexible in every sense, both not working uh, in an office and also, you know, allowing people to manage um, their kind of duties as parents and, and, and other potentially other jobs, you know, whatever it is. Um, we we're keen to be, we've got some team members who have in the past been interested in starting their own businesses for example and we're keen to support that um, and if we become a launch pad for them you know they will not be helping us but we'll also you know be happy to have been part of that yeah process. and so, so allowing people to be human and have, <clears throat> have that life yeah. that work and um, surely i'm going to come to you next um would love to know when you joined what were some of the first things that you decided to tackle and how did you approach that you came with a lot of experience first of all so yeah, uh, could you talk to that a little bit? Uh, good morning, Geraldine. Um, when I first joined James, it was sort of like um, just a little bit more than part time. And it and James knows it was a little bit haphazard and disorganized. So and it really did need good, robust systems put into place. James is an amazing boss. He still is. And it's been it's just a it's been a pleasure, to be honest, to help. So what I started off doing was organizing the internal system so that everyone was able to find things, for example, like email filing, making sure documents are in the place so everyone can just think, oh, I need to go there. Um, I did something like setting up styles in Word so that all of our documents are consistent and they're much easier for people to work with. Things like shared calendars, contacts and, and one thing and another. So simple things, but the little things make, make a huge difference. Yeah, and I imagine a lot of those things are still in place now. Yeah, yeah, they're all still in place. And, and I think what we're doing now, we, we build on them um, so that going forward, everything's super easy and quick for people to use so that they they get the most of their time out of doing their fee earning work and as little time on the admin stuff that they need to do. And that seems to work for the team really, really well. Great. Thank you, Shirley. And, and Joe, come to you next. Thank you for joining us. And um, when it comes to picking up on what Shirley just spoke to there on the admin side of things, you, you're a practicing um, lawyer. So um, could you talk a little bit more about, about that and how you manage that side um, and also the internal work that you were hired to do then as well? 
Morning, Geraldine. Uh, yeah, so it's it's great to have that variety in a role, and it's quite unique, I think, in that sense. Um, for, on the one side, I do the client-facing commercial work, which is ancillary to the corporate stuff, so helping out with commercial agreements and dealing with the clients, um, and on the other hand, doing the internal PSL-type work. Um, so there's never a day that's the same, um, and I, I get to work with Shirley a lot, which is a joy um, on the PSL-type stuff, so... Um, you know, file openings, file closings, risk management, that sort of thing. Um, and it's just nice to, to be able to dip into both things. Um, obviously, the client stuff is more urgent because um, it's external, um, but the internal PSL stuff is always, there's always stuff to do. So there's never a quiet day and it's always varied. Um, but we're lucky to be part of a, a great team. And um, it's amazing to see how it's, you know, from the start to where it is now. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and just picking up on, on the, you mentioned the client stuff that comes that comes like top of the list all, all the time. And it was referenced in, in the chat as well, uh, setting expectations when it comes to processes with clients. And um, how have you found that if, if a process change and you're working with a client, have you found that um, it has been difficult to, to get the clients to, to use a new process? And when I say process system, and um, steps, things like that. Well, I think one example would be this um, technology we use called Legal, which allows us to onboard clients quite easily. Um, and I think clients have taken that to that quite well. Um, maybe Shirley and James could comment on this too, but it certainly helped us um, from a process perspective. But I think because of, you know, for them as well, it makes it a lot easier for them to um, upload their KYC documents and sign up our, our onboarding document. Um, so our, in, in our experience with that, it's been quite easy, but sometimes, yeah, change can be hard to implement, um, just getting used to new new processes. Yeah, I think, um, as your client said last week, that who just completed the, the legal process for um, on, of onboarding, that it was the simplest that they'd, they'd been through in a long time. Um, and I think our, my experience with the um, processes is that they they sort of need to, fit the client need and it, we've definitely implemented things that clients haven't used at all um, and we sort of tried to push them and cajole them and it seemed you know like an amazing opportunity for them and actually they just weren't interested you know things like client portals um, we've never had much success with because for a lot of clients it's just something new to log into and forget the password for um, and they don't really understand why they have to do it and they're not doing it anyway um, and so you know even where we've said well we can show you you know your work in progress and we can save all your documents in this thing and it's already good you know it's going to be like a ready-made data room so when you come to do your fundraise you know it's all there you don't have to do any effort they just you know they just never log in <laughs> and then um and then and, and it doesn't and you say oh i said it within the portal and they go why do i have to do this thing so um i think it has to it has to work on both sides and likewise you know um we have to change the process has to, has to really fit for us so um we've got um, you know, sometimes we change processes deliberately to uh, to address an issue that we've got with a specific client. So, so, you know, it's either that the client will change and adapt to the process, or you know, it may be that that sort of starts to be the the way of us not working with that client very much um, going forward. Um, and and sometimes we adapt our, our processes to 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 work with it better with a specific client. But I what I think. As we're going to the next phase of, of what we're doing, we've done a lot of trying to adapt to our clients and taking a, a, a we, we obviously take a client centered centric approach, but there's a there's there's a way of being client centric which suits us, and there's a way of being client centric which is too much weighted towards the client. Um, you know, we and and what happens if you if you distort your processes too much for one client or another client is that you you find that you'd start delivering, it, it, it pulls everything out of kilt and you start delivering things worse across the board. So, um, you know, in order to be sort of scalable to go to the topic of the webinar, um, the, the process has to be consistent. Everything, you know, you need to be able to make it as consistent as possible. So legal um, has been successful with us recently. We, we've probably used it for about a year and a half. And I think at the beginning we were getting, you know, a small amount of value out of it. And over time we sort of kept coming back to it until we found a, a, a configuration that works and that works really really well where um we can share a link via even by text message with with a client and they can do the full onboarding um from signing their engagement letter completing their kyc and putting funds on account um from their phone in a in a matter of a couple of minutes um and and that's really driven you know unlocked a sort of potential for 
the types of smaller matters that we were talking about earlier, um, which were just if if you know we could we could waste uh, enough time to sort of absorb all of the profit and probably some of the you know, the, the rest of the funds on a small matter, chasing KYC documents and and asking for funds on account in the past. And now that's 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 gone. So sort of that's an example of a process that's worked really well for us. But it's definitely trial and error that's got us to that with legal. And I think um, I, we were probably a bit guilty of being over ambitious in this speed of implementation with most of these things. Um, I would say that when we adopted new software like Clio, for example, you know, at the beginning with Clio, we were using it for matter numbering and, and billing, and that was it. Um, we'd record time, obviously, but that, that, that was really the only two features of Clio that we were using at all. Uh, and now, f four or five years later, we're, we're sort of starting to mine things, but they're probably every week we find something new that we want to use. And it takes us a while to get it going, you know, and if it doesn't first kind of work, if, you, if the first time you try and use it with a client or, or, or internally, it probably means that, there's a, that you're going about it slightly the wrong way. And even if you've sort of worked out that that's, the, that's where you want to get to, you, you probably haven't found the path yet to, to doing that. That's been my experience. So, um, you yeah, know, it's sort of the, these, these things take time and you have to keep chipping away at, the, at them until they get to the right shape. And then... And then they kind of form a little bear, they sort of silt up over time and, and, and that's how you build the improvements. Yeah. yeah, our attempts at sort of top down, you know, let's plan a path from A to B and just do it has, has never really never really worked out. Okay. And just like we're getting kind of into that change management piece with with, <clears throat> with staff and, and team members, and that was the biggest challenge that people identified during the poll. Um so talking to that a little bit more, you seem to have answered a little bit, you know, that incremental start small and not go the top down approach. For far, where does change get instigated? Is it is it from different team members who, for if you were to pick technology, are there different folks coming to, to you, James, to you, Shirley or Joe, with ideas for different tech, different systems, um, ideas of working with clients, or how does that work? Um I'd say it comes from everywhere, really. I think that I think that you know, there's so much. We're still in a very early, early phase, and there's so much to improve across pretty much everything that we do. And there probably is for the next decade of of the firm and, and beyond. Um, and every time we we take a step forward, there's new things that need doing. And so um, there's no, you know, we're very we're pretty flat in terms of hierarchy. People are welcome to suggest things, change things, take the initiative on things. Um, I am interested in legal technology, and so I probably generate a lot of ideas, most of which hopefully get shot down by someone before they take flight, because uh, otherwise we just get up with hundreds of subscriptions to things that we barely use. But, um, but uh, you know, so I originate a lot of things, but mostly out of interest. And then, um, but, you know, other people identify the need, and we've started doing one of the processes that we've implemented in the last year, thanks to our compliance consultants, um, I think Priya is on actually Priya from Candor, um, who does who helps us with our compliance is is one-to-one um, -one quarterly appraisals, and in those processes we we definitely you know get ideas of things that need to change um, within the within the firm, and some of that um, comes out of software, some of it doesn't come out of software. Some we, we've we've adopted things and sort of unadopted things and discovered that we already had software that could could do what we were trying to do in the first place. So it's very much, you know, trial and error. There's a little bit of process around adoption, but quite often we just, if we really think we need it, we try it and, and see how it goes. Mm. There's a question that came in here from Anand. So do you use any specific technology to grow your client base? Um, yeah, we've, um, that's a good one. We've tried lots of different things uh, with limited success. We have, um, we basically use LinkedIn. At the moment, we use LinkedIn and we're using Clear Grow. Um, and that's that's pretty much it. I mean, you know, yeah, the, the, the things that you need to be able to do, I guess, are book appointments with people um, and get in front of people. We don't use any email, we don't do any email marketing at the moment, but we will probably use something but like a MailChimp or, or whatever in the near future. Mm. Um, but it's, yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty basic uh, and we, we tried lots of different um, CRM systems over over time uh, but I think clear grow is the best one 
for us just because it does you know you just push things straight into um clear once you once you're engaged so you know any any software that reduces the amount of steps from one process to another process is, is great uh, and even if there are better there may be better crm systems so again in, in, out there and I, I have no idea but um for us probably the, one of the prime movers for whether we adopt something or not is, is how easy it's going to be to integrate into the rest of our processes without having introducing more manual steps for mm. for shirley in particular who, who runs a lot of those um, Shirley, I think you were involved quite a lot in the, the Clio Grow deciding to go that route. Could you talk a little bit about that and, and how it look, what it looked like when you were implementing, implementing it? Because you were using Clio Manage before. Yeah, uh, we used Clio Manage firstly. And then um, not so long ago, we thought about going to Clio Grow. And the brilliant thing for that, as James has just mentioned, is that you could have all the information in Clio Grow and then when somebody, when we've onboarded something, they come, you can push everything across into Clio Manage without having to retype everything out again, enter all their details. And it, it's such a time saver and it's really easy to use. So anyone that's used it has said, oh gosh, this is really easy. Um, so again, if something's easy, people are gonna be um, keen to use something than that, like that piece of software, rather than if you've got something that takes forever and is complicated and and one thing and another so i i found it great to be honest and it's been really really helpful fantastic and james you were just mentioning when we were in our waiting room earlier you started using the scheduler element of it as well yeah you, i had my first meeting that's one book through this the scheduler but the scheduler is an interesting one because it's one of those processes that you know i i, I feel like people um use the Calendly a lot and in our world at least the, the tech companies that we work with and I, I actually find that sort of there's a way of doing that which is sort of non-consensual which isn't, isn't isn't very you know if someone just fires a, a link at you and says oh if you want to speak to me use this link and, um, and you know and book book a session I find that a bit sort of take it or leave it and there are meetings that definitely benefit from being sh scheduled just via email slowly or even by phone um so i tend to offer it as, a, as an either or you know if you prefer to book a, a slot here's the link but otherwise you know i can meet you at 11 30 on tuesday um i think is much more polite whereas the, the sort of yeah the tendency just to send you a candidly link and say this is the only way i can possibly book a meeting with you uh so you have to do all the effort i find a bit annoying frankly um, right thank you thank you james the question here actually just the difference is there between your use of your <clears throat> and legal um, I'm not sure who's probably best to answer this probably Shirley or James um, and how how you use it because you're using both but you're using them in different ways so maybe you could talk about so that. So we use legal for a very specific part which is um, the the signing of engagement letters the KYC and then and then the funds on account and I think the funds on account is probably the biggest value add in legal for us we could probably we could do the signing of engagement letters um through clear grow but we don't we couldn't do the, the kyc through clear clear grow because um we don't have that sort of auto, you know the, the processing for the passports etc but the 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 funds on account and i know the clear in america has has a has a clear pay solution um but that's probably the best one for us because i, I do think that um of all of the headaches in running a law firm one is probably uh recruitment and then the other is is kind of cash flow and um having the facility to take funds on account is is a wonderful thing that someone in the legal profession worked out you know whatever it was 100 years ago um but it, it still requires you know when you send an email if you do it manually um sending people emails to say please can you put the funds in our account over and over again is damaging to the relationship if nothing else um and it's also just a waste of time Whereas being able to have a button at the end of the pro sign up process where they can you know, inc pay, including with Apple Pay, uh, to put funds and the funds land in your client account in a kind of fully compliant way um, is has been a bit of a game changer for us, actually. And so that's the reason we go with the clear gray. It's, uh, legal. it's just like a very um, uh, contained process. And then in clear grow, uh, we're starting to do more and more work with forms and sort of onboarding forms. We don't do anything without that, that feature at the moment in Clear Grow, but we're about to start, I think, because 
um, you know, we get this certain types of work that we have over and over again. But at the moment, we, you know, different lawyers do different things, but sometimes they'll send out a, a questionnaire or an A4 document that says, please fill in the table. And so I think those things should probably move their way into clear grow. Um, and then people can fill them out at the early stage and get captured on the file. Fantastic. Thank you, James. And um, just conscious we're up on, on our 45 minutes. So we're just going to run for a couple of minutes more. And um, if you do need to pop off, we are recording. So we we'll send you the recording afterwards. But uh, yeah, just wants to kind of shift gears a little bit and, and talk a little bit about what's to come, what, what's on the cards for, for Farha. Uh, Joe, coming to you first of all, um, from a from a compliance and regulation perspective, there seems to be lots on the cards. So yeah, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as Jane mentioned, James mentioned, we're working with uh, Candle, um, a great consultancy firm that helps us with our compliance. Um, and we are aiming towards an Excel accreditation. Um, it's a big project and I'm really happy to be part of that. Um, so really what that involves is um, looking at all our um, systems, um, making sure we've got all our policies and procedures in place, um, file opening, file closing, um, everything is up to those standards that we need to be at. Um, SRA compliant and also um, Lexel compliant. So the aim is to really work on those, making sure we've got risk um, uh, assessment forms on each file, um, all the correct KYC on each file and that sort of thing. Um, so that we're at a point where we can have that external Lexel um, uh, uh, reviewer to come you know, visit us and review some of our files and see that we are up to that standing, get that badge on our website. That's the aim. Um, it's, it's a big piece of work and we're very lucky to have um, Candle helping us with that process. Brilliant. That sounds good. I'll, I'll be watching the space. Uh, uh, I think we have a, I'll, I'll share a blog post with you as well. We have a blog post on our website around Excel accreditation and different steps that need to be taken. Um, um, and then just from a recruitment growth head headcount perspective, James, what, what's what's it looking like for, for the foreseeable? Are you hiring right now? Is it consultant? Is it full time? Should you talk a little bit there? Yeah, we, we um, definitely are looking for uh, sort of mid-tier corporate um, associate level resources. That's where we've got the bulk of our bulk of our work. Um, and I think we'll we'll need to bring in one or two um, lawyers over sort of between now and September in that in that space. Um, and uh, and then the plan is to continue continue growing. There's a sort of a dance between bringing in more work and bringing in more lawyers where you have to, you know, the, the, the dis, there are slightly different timetables and, and in the fundraising space, you're, you, you don't have that much control over when someone needs to raise, raise funds. Um, so we probably grow by um, growing the client base before we grow, grow until, we, until we really need someone to bring in an, another lawyer. But I think we're at that point with the corporate, um, the corporate team. Uh, so the plan is to, to continue growing. Um, you know, through the year uh, and build, building this sort of portfolio of companies that we work very closely with um, and have close relationships with uh, and, and support, you know, on an ongoing basis. And I think that that's something that we'll just try to do better and better and and for more and more companies. Uh, there, there'll probably be a, a hard limit on how um, big we get. Was There's this quite a, to me, there's a benefit to being smaller and staying focused. And I think we'll probably, you know, we'll never try to become a, a sprawling um, multidisciplinary practice across lots of offices. We'll, we'll just, uh, we've got this target of helping companies to go from early stage and grow. And, and that's that's what we'll focus on. So we've got some quite a lot of space to expand into in that, in that area, but um, whether or not we spill out into other things is to be seen. Okay, makes sense. Thank, thank you for sharing. I want to call out that our next installment in this How to Grow a Law Firm series will take place in just over two weeks from now on May 25th. And in this session, we'll be joined by multi award winning law firm Illum Legal and their co founders, Kate Partridge and Michelle Harris. And the topic for that discussion, which we kind of touched a little bit on today, is around that consultancy model and how they adopted that consultancy model for growth at their firm. Um, and my colleague, Laura Leach, who's, who's working her magic in the background there, is going to pop a link for that link for that webinar in the chat. And um, so if you're not already registered, you can register there. Um, I'm also very delighted and excited to reveal and to announce that we are going to be making a return of our popular and highly regarded Innovate Legal series, um, which is an in-person event series that brings together legal experts and legal professionals 
and it first kicked off in 2019 with uh, we ran eight different events around the UK and Ireland. We will kick off uh, this round of events with two events, one in London on the 9th of June and one in Dublin in Ireland on the 23rd of June. So if you do want to attend uh, either of those events, please uh, please do come along. We'd love to have you join us. Um, Laura, again, is going to share links for both of those in the chat. Uh, guests that we have for the speaking sessions for both events. Um, we've got Alice Stevenson, CEO and founder of Stevenson Law, is going to be joining us. Uh, Aaron Chowan, uh, founder of Tenet Compliance and Litigation. Colin Bohanna, our general manager here at Clio. Uh, Hannah Becko, founder of Attentively Speaking. Rob Hanna is going to be there from the Legally Speaking podcast. Um, and in Dublin, we've also got lawyer Richard Grogan, who is um, an award-winning lawyer over here and also is fast becoming a TikTok sensation. Um, so yeah, please do join us if you can for either of those events. Uh, Laura will share the links for both of those in the chat and they'll run from 5.30 to 9.30, a mix of a little bit of programs, some networking and conversation as well. Um, so finally, just again, thank you. Thank you so much to James, Joe and Shirley for joining us, taking time out of their very busy calendars to, to come and join us. Um, and really for sharing uh, and being so open with your growth story, sharing key insights into your approach. Uh, it really is fantastic to see such openness and honesty. Um, and I'd also like to quickly thank Laura Leach as well, who's in the background for helping, helping us out with the chat today. Um, and we know that a lawyer's schedule is a hectic one. So thank you to everyone else for joining us um, for today's morning session, the second in our series. And if there is anyone on the call who would be interested in participating or has a, a unique growth story to share and to tell, please do feel free to pop me an email um, and we can have a chat about potentially featuring you in a future episode of the series. So have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us.